Hello, my friends. Welcome back to another lesson. In this lesson, we are going to be breaking down an overview of libraries. So libraries are a new addition that came to PineScript in version 5. So version 5, as of recording this video, was released very recently, and libraries are brand new. They are a new type of publication, meaning a script publication, on the TradingView script library, where all TradingView scripts are found that allows you to create custom functions to be reused in other scripts. So if you're familiar with other programming languages like Java, for example, this sort of thing would be called a class or a module perhaps in other languages. Basically, you write your code once like any other regular script in PineScript, but then once you save that script and publish it to the TradingView platform, you can reference the code from that script in any amount of other scripts. So I'll show you what I mean in a moment when we drop into the Pine editor. But first of all, let's read some of the documentation. So once a library is published, other scripts, be it indicator strategies or even other libraries can import it and use its functions. You can use libraries to include complex algorithms or frequently used functions so that you or the whole Pine community can easily reuse them. So let's jump over to the user manual and have a quick read of the theory behind libraries in Pine. So here we are on the documentation page. The purpose of libraries is to define frequently used functions so their source code does not have to be included in every script where they are needed, meaning you don't need to copy and paste your code into multiple scripts. So me, for example, I have over 30 scripts published on the TradingView platform and a good number of them use code that I need to copy and paste into all of my scripts. For example, my candlestick detection code is a good example of that. I tend to use the same candlestick patterns across all of my trading scripts. So I might have a strategy that has different market conditions and entry reasons, entry criteria, but I always combine that entry criteria with an entry pattern. And those patterns are usually the candlestick patterns that I understand that I can easily identify and that I have found to have an edge over the market. Instead of copy and pasting my setup detection code across all of my scripts, I can just write that code into a library and I can import that library into my scripts and reference that code. Not only does this save space in my scripts and declutter my scripts a bit because there's just less code in my scripts, it also centralizes my code in a way that allows me to update my code more easily. So if I discover a way to optimize a candlestick pattern detection, um, or I just want to change the way that I detect a certain pattern, I can do that in one script, and then I can easily reference that script across all of my scripts without having to go back and copy and paste that code into all of them. So a library be published either privately or publicly before it can be used in another script. And you cannot use a private library in a public script. So if you publish your library as private and you have the code hidden, you cannot then import that private library into a public script. But if you have two private scripts, you can import a private library into a private script. So public scripts can only use public libraries and they must be open source. So you cannot use a private library or a library with hidden source code in a public script that is not allowed. But private scripts or personal scripts saved in the Pine editor can use either public or private libraries. There's no limitation for private scripts. And a library can use other libraries or even previous versions of itself. So every time you publish a library, it gets a new version number. And apparently you can reference older versions of your library within your library script, which is pretty cool. Now, library programmers should be familiar with Pine's typing nomenclature, nomenclature uh, scopes, and user-defined functions. So that's why this section of the course is much later on than other categories or subjects. And then finally, you can browse the library scripts published publicly by members in TradingView's community scripts. Now, to create a library is very simple. We just use the library annotation function. The same way we use indicator and strategy annotation functions for a library, we just use library. Now this library script type has a bunch of limitations and special syntax that does not apply to indicator or strategy scripts. Now you can do most things that you can do in an indicator script, but there are some important limitations that we need to go over. So a library contains exportable function definitions, which constitute the only visible part of the library when it is used by another script. So we have a new keyword here to work with called export. Anything in your library script that does not begin with the export keyword cannot be seen by other scripts. 
So you can do all sorts of things in your library scripts that you can do in an indicator script, for example. But when it comes to publicly publishing your library, when you use the export keyword, that limits certain behaviors of your script. Uh, we'll go over the limitations in a moment, but let's keep reading on. So libraries can also use other Pine code in their global scope like a normal indicator. And then they have an example down here. So here they're defining a library. Here would be your script code, and you can use any uh, regular Pine script indicator code in this part of your script. But when it comes to exporting your functions, you need to do it like this. You need to use the export keyword, give your function a name, and then assign parameters to your function. The main difference between this and a regular user defined function is that you actually need to specify the type of variable you're working with. Now, here are a few notes. The description comment, the function comment, param or parameter comment and returns compiler directive comments are all optional, but TradingView highly recommend that you use them because they serve a double purpose. They document the library's code and they populate the default library description when you publish your library, which authors can use uh, when they read your script's description on the TradingView community um, scripts website. Now the export keyword is mandatory. So your library must export at least one function. The parameter type is also mandatory, contrary to user-defined function parameter definitions in indicators or strategies, which are typeless. And finally, the script code in this example uh, can be any code you would normally use in an indicator, including inputs or plots. All right, moving on, they have an example here, but we'll skip over this because I'll code my own example with you guys in a moment. Uh, let's have a quick read of the library functions documentation. So function definitions in libraries are slightly different than those of user-defined functions in indicators and strategies. There are constraints as to what can be included in the body of library functions. This is important. In library function signatures, which is their first line, the export keyword is mandatory. The type of argument expected for each parameter must be explicitly mentioned. And a simple or series form modifier can restrict the allowable forms of arguments. And the next section explains their use. We'll get to that in a moment. Now, these are the constraints imposed on library functions. They cannot use variables from the library's global scope unless they are of constant form or const form. This means you cannot use global variables initialized from script inputs, for example, or globally declared arrays. We cannot use the request um, namespace. We cannot use the input namespace, and we cannot plot, fill, or change the background color of our charts in our exported library functions. And then finally, library functions always return a result that is either of simple, which is basically just a single instance of a value, or a series form, which is a list of values, kind of like open, high, low, and close, or indicator values. All of those values are of series form. A simple form would be like the number one, just the number one that does not change on each bar. It's just a standard simple data type. You cannot use them to calculate values where constant or input forms are required, as is the case with some Pine built-in function arguments. And in a moment, we'll jump in the Pine editor and go over some code examples where this will make a lot more sense. But before we do that, let's have one last quick look at argument form control. So the form of arguments supplied in calls to library functions is auto-detected based on how the argument is used inside the function. If the argument can be used in series form, then it is. If it cannot be used in series form, then an attempt is made with the simple type form. And they have a little example here. Um, here is a better example, I think, that explains the simple and the series um, context in these library functions. So while library functions cannot return results of constant or input forms, they can be written to produce a result of simple form. And here is an example of where that is useful. So here we have a library function called make ticker ID. It's exported, so it's importable by other scripts. We have defined the type of each argument. So each of these arguments, prefix and ticker are both strings. And then the function exports or returns this value here. Now this code right here will not compile. The reason for that is that these two values are treated as series forms. If you change them to simple, simple string prefix and simple string ticker, now this code will compile. So I know that a lot of this will be quite confusing. I think it will be better to jump into the Pine editor to show some examples 
Um, but just before we do that, before we jump to the editor, the final thing here is that you can publish your libraries and before you can use a library, it must be published. So you cannot use libraries that you haven't published. You can't just use your private scripts as libraries. They need to be published to the TradingView platform. You can publish them as private so that no one can see the code, but then you cannot use that private library in a public script, but you can use it in your private scripts. So that's important to mention. The library must be published before it can be referenced by the TradingView service, basically. So if you want to share your library with all trading viewers, publish it publicly. If you want to use it privately, then use a private publication. Uh, one important thing to mention when publishing your libraries, I got in trouble for this by the TradingView moderated theme, is that as with indicators or strategies, the active chart when you publish a library will appear in both its widgets, uh, sorry, in its widget and script page. Meaning that when you go to the TradingView platform and see your script, there'll be like a screenshot or like a, um, basically whatever indicators you have on your chart and whatever drawing tools, all of that stuff will be visible. And so if you publish a library script while you have several other indicators active on your charts, you'll get in trouble for that because it's confusing to the users who view your library. It might not be clear what your library does. So you should only publish your library script with any indicators that are relevant to that library. If you have indicators on your chart that are not relevant to your library when you publish your library, your script may get removed by the moderated team. You don't get in trouble for it, really. You just get a bit of a rousing from the um, TradingView police. Anyway, let's jump over to the editor now and have a play around with our first library script. So here I am on the TradingView charts. Let's open up the Pine editor. All I have here is a blank library script. Let's change the title and overlay to false. So the first thing to note is that you cannot have spaces in your library name. If I save this code, we'll get an error. Invalid argument title in library. It cannot contain spaces, special characters, or begin with a digit. The reason for this is that when it comes time to import your library, it needs to be all one word so that you can reference it as a sort of URL. So this is kind of like a URL. Here is a library I've published and it contains my username and then my library name. And it's all one word with no spaces. If there was a space in here, uh, that upsets the Pine compiler, as you can see by my syntax highlight coloring changing there. The next thing to mention is that we need at least one exported function. So now if I just plot NA and save my code, oh, and I change this back to all one word with no spaces, we get another error down here. The library should contain at least one exported function. So let's add an exported function really quickly. I'm just gonna call this export f for function. And this function um, will just return one, the number one. So this is exactly the same as a regular user defined function, except that it starts with the export keyword to tell TradingView that we want this function to be able to be referenced or imported by other scripts. So now when I save my code, this should compile without any errors. There we go, no problems there. Let's add it to my chart. And you can see that it looks like any other indicator. It's plotting NA onto the chart, which is permitted. So now if we wanted to, we could plot this exported function into our library indicator box. So if I plot F here, our F function, save my code, this will actually plot the number one onto my library script. So that is allowed. However, if I wanted to get a user input, let's just get x equals input.int and we'll title this um, input and give it a default value of two. If I try to multiply this value by our user input x, when I save my code now, we will get an error because the exported function f depends on the x input variable, which is not allowed. So unlike regular user functions in indicator scripts and strategy scripts, we cannot use inputs in our functions, in our export functions. If I create a new function here and call this, um, let's call it n, and we can assign it one times x and save my code, uh, get rid of this call here. That works fine as well. So our script is now compiled, everything's fine. However, if we try to reference this function, which exists within the global scope of our script, we'll get an error again. So if I multiply one by n, save my code, we get an error because exported function f contains an input call. This is because we are using our n function, which depends on x, which is an input call that is not allowed in libraries. We also cannot use the request namespace. So here, if I try to request.security, uh, let's just go siminfo.tickerid, and the next parameter is a timeframe. So we'll just do timeframe.period. 
and our expression will just get the current closing price. If I save this code, we'll get another error down here because exported function f contains a request function call, which is not allowed. So there's a lot of strange nuances to libraries that will take some getting used to. In the lessons to come, I'll break down my own libraries. I currently own the library published publicly, but I'll break down that library in the course here to show you a practical example of libraries. Now, as I mentioned at the start of this lesson, this is a new feature, so I'm still trying to um, wrap my head around it and learn the intricacies of it myself. And so I'll flesh this part of the course out as I learn more about libraries and become more familiar with them. For now, I only have one library, that's all I really need. But I imagine in the future, I might have multiple for different purposes. For example, I might create a library for strategy automation, and then I might have a library for candlestick pattern detection. Uh, right now, everything's just contained under the one library, but in the future, I could see myself splitting up parts of my scripts that I reuse across multiple scripts into specific libraries. But for now, to wrap up this lesson, let me show you how to import existing libraries or published libraries, be they your own or other traders libraries into your scripts. So if we wanted to reference this library that we just created, um, first we need to make sure it compiles, obviously, and then we can publish it by clicking publish and then it will publish our script to the TradingView platform. You can select public or private, but you cannot reference the script here until you have published it either publicly or privately. And I went over the limitations of publishing your library privately. All that means is you cannot use your library in public scripts. So let me open up a new blank indicator here and we'll import my Zen library. So to do that, we just type out import space. And then here is a list of all of the available libraries on TradingView. And there actually aren't that many yet because this is a new feature. There aren't that many coders who have published libraries. Uh, but here is my library, Zen in the Art of Trading forward slash Zen library. And then it will show you the latest version of the library. So right now, my library is currently version two. If I click on that, I've now imported my library. And if I wanted to, I could reference any of the variables from this library. So if I just write here, zen library dot control space, I'll get a list of uh, custom functions that I've written and exported in my library. So for example, I can get the decimals of the current market I have on my charts. So if I save this script and I add it to my chart, you can see that my custom function here is returning five. It's plotting five onto the chart. And that is how many decimal places are on the current market that I've loaded onto my chart, Euro dollar. Euro dollar has one, two, three, four, five decimal places. And this value is useful for doing things like converting pips into whole numbers. Um, and that is something I do frequently in all of my scripts. And so that is why this function is in my Zen library. It makes it really easy to reference this function without having to copy and paste the code from that function into every script I create. So that's the basic crash course overview of libraries. I'll show you things before we end this lesson. Uh, the first is how to use aliases with libraries. And the second is we'll jump over to the TradingView platform and have a look at some other libraries that are out there. So first of all, aliases. If you want to, you can assign an alias to the library name. So you can import the library and just reference the library directly like I have here, just by the library name. Or you can use the as keyword and put anything after this and the library will now be able to be referenced with this keyword. So if I change this to Zen and save my code, my script still works. We're still plotting five. Even though we're not referencing Zen library, we are referencing Zen as an alias for this library. And this could be anything. I could call this uh, just Z, for example, to keep it really short. And now it's just Z.getDecimals. So that's a really cool feature. So that's how we use aliases. That's how we import libraries. That's how we create libraries. I'll go into more detail about how to create exported functions in the next lessons to come. But finally, to wrap this up, let's jump over to the community scripts webpage and have a look at other libraries. And I'll show you how the documentation looks for user-defined libraries. So here we are on the TradingView uh, scripts library uh, community page. If I scroll down, here are all the publicly published libraries that we have to work with. So let's find mine first of all, to begin with. I'm just going to write up here, Zen library into scripts and search that. And here's my Zen library here. Uh, if I open this page up and scroll down, here is the description of my Zen library and it contains all of the documentation and explanation for each parameter and each function. So it explains what the function does and it explains what the parameters are for. 
and then it explains what the function returns. So if I scroll all the way down to the source code here, which we'll cover in the next lesson, you can see all of this documentation here, all of this commenting that explains what each function does. All of this um, commenting gets automatically converted into my library description, so I don't have to write all of this out twice. We just write it once in our code, and then people who reference our code can see it directly in the code, and then those who view and browse through the uh, TradingView scripts library can read about it in the um, library description as well. But let's go back and have a look at other people's libraries. So here's an interesting one that looks like it might be easy to play around with. Awesome color. This library provides a variety of colors. So let's import this into our script. If I scroll down here to this part here, where it explains what the library is, you can click on this little copy link here, or you can just copy the text there, or just type into the Pine editor, this guy's username, control space, and it will pop up uh, all, of, all of the libraries published under that username. But let's jump back over to the Pine editor. Uh, one other thing to mention is you can import multiple libraries. So if we want to here, I can paste in that uh, import code and I'll give this an alias as well. I'll just call this as B. And now let's see what is contained within B. If I type B dot control space, we'll get a list of all of the functions um, contained within this library. Everything here after B dot is contained within that library. So let's click on one of these and see what happens. Save my code. So this function takes a color parameter. So let's define this color variable and let's jump back over to the documentation for this script and see how this function works. So the color parameter is the name of the color group. So let's see what that means. So here are the available colors for each function. Let's scroll down to the one that we're using, which is um, music. And here are our options. So let's try ice green. So if I paste into this parameter here, ice green and save my code, hopefully this compiles. There we go, no problem. Let's set the plot color to our cull variable and see what this ice green okay music uh, function returns. Save my code, and there we go. So kind of a nice pale green color. And that's it for libraries. They're pretty simple to wrap your head around, obviously more complicated to create. Using them is easier. But in the lessons to come, we will explore creating libraries and working with them in more detail. For now, that will do it for this lesson. I'll speak with you in the next one.